Fuzzy dice, check. Whacker con bobblehead doll, check. Diesel incense, uh, check. Cool. Look at me, I'm a taxi cab driver. What's going on, everyone? Oh no, I muted it. Hello, and welcome to another Fantastic Tuesday. Man, that is really loud. <laughs> welcome to another Fantastic Tuesday here on the Exploding Dice channel. I am so happy to be here, guys. We are so hyped tonight because you are hanging out with us tonight on Fuzzy Dice, your Dungeon Master show here on the Exploding Dice channel. And we are hanging out as part of Twitch's uh, Tabletop Community Spotlight, they have decided, somehow, against all better judgment, that we should be on the front page. I don't know why. I don't know what we did to deserve it. But I'm so sorry for whatever happens. Uh, <laughs> I am excited. I have a special beer that I've been, I've been saving for a little while. Uh, for those of you who are new to the channel, you know that drinking is an integral part of what we do here. Uh, so, let's, uh, let's turn Optimus Rhyme off. And let's put some fantasy music on, because we have a fantastic show for you tonight, and I am so excited for it. Uh, I have, right next to me, on this side, my special guest and new best friend, Mr. Lord. Is it Lord? It is Lord, right? Lord, indeed. Yes, absolutely. That's why I'm wearing <laughs> the crown here. Oh, I have <laughs> Lord uh, British himself, Lord Richard Garriott, hanging out with me, and we are going to have a fantastic time. How is it going, man? Uh, it is going great. I'm very excited to be with you here today. Uh, by good chance, I happen to have a lot of show-and-tell stuff with me, so uh, I think uh, we're going to have a good time. Absolutely. Can we start? We let's start things off by getting some uh, some ED love in the chat. Exploding dice love. If you guys don't know, I'm going to go ahead and share it for you. Exclamation point emote. Uh, we have a whole bunch of custom emotes that you can use, and they will make everything better. They will bring the madness to the chat uh, as Dice Thulu, our patron, takes over. So ED, uh, ED love is how we show our uh, our tentacly our tentacly appreciation. Um, yeah, so I I'm seriously I'm so hyped. Uh, I hope you guys are I hope you guys are gonna have a good time. If you haven't already, please hit that retweet link. Um, uh, Dice Thulu will put it in chat. You can share the link with everyone. Let us know, or let them know that you are hanging out here with us on the channel, and it's gonna be fantastic. Uh, so let's, let's not waste a ton of time. Let's dive right into it. I do have some announcements before we go. Uh, as you guys can see, down in the corner of the screen, somewhere over there, it's like... I'm, I'm trying to figure out which way my camera's pointing, but it's always flipped. It's it's in that corner of the screen somewhere. Uh, we are well on our way and not far away now from our big road to 1K. That is the um, the big 1K follow goal that we've been we've been racing towards here on the channel, and we're we're just about to hit it. So if you guys uh, hit that follow button, help us get to the goal. You can see that you will unlock a an epic 24-hour D&D stream here on the channel. It'll be the first of this channel's history, and there are so many great guests and stuff lined up for it. It's amazing. So I hope you guys help us get there. Uh, please hit that follow button. Join us. You get all kinds of D&D content, content coming with you, coming at you every week, and you get to be part of Dice Thulu's minions. Um, so super excited about that uh the second uh announcement is we have started every week on this channel we do a fan art contest where you can submit your uh your fan art from the show characters anything like that and you have a chance to win a brand new awesomely a colored new pair of a uh, whole set of D, D dice so you get your d20 your d12 your d8 all of them uh different different patterns every week I will show them off on Twitter each week, and you can enter and win. Uh, and right away, thank you so much to Shroud of the Avatar for following. Thank you, my man. Welcome to the madness, and I, I'm drinking in your honor. Uh, and um, As you may know, we, uh, we, we drink pretty heavily in all of our uh, video uh, chats and broadcasts as well. So we are kindred spirits from the get-go. <laughs> <laughs> it is, um, we're, we'll actually talk, we can talk about this later, but, uh, we, we sort of, 
uh, I decided that when I started the, the new show on this channel, it'd be really funny if we transferred some old drinking rules that a friend of mine came up with, which is just like on a nat one, the party drinks, on a nat 20, the DM drinks, and on a new follower, everyone drinks. Um, but the uh, what I didn't know is that my players were like, they were already going I to be drinking follower. heavily regardless. <laughs> so, uh... And thank you so much, Darkstar9, for joining. Welcome to the madness, my friend. Thank you for joining us. Um, I don't think I have any immediate announcements right away, so let's just dive right into the content, my friend. And I'm going to turn it over to um, to my friend Richard. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your your kind of history, where you come from, and what exactly you, uh, you do in this community? Absolutely. Well, you know, uh, first, uh, let me again say thanks for having me on. Absolutely, Excited to be here. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and especially because I am a D&D &D player of the First Order, meaning from way back in the saddle-stapled three-book set and the extra add-on rules written by, uh, you know, Gary and others, uh, Chainmail and a couple of the others. And, uh, and as I was showing you, you know, when we... When we first sat down, I even still have my original uh, Lord British uh, character sheet and extra things that I used to carry around uh, in my, you know, very, very early games back in, you know, 1977 era. And so, uh, uh, and where I got my pseudonym, Lord British, actually is from Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, you know, and where that, uh, how that happened is in the summer of my sophomore year in high school, I... Uh, uh, was uh, I went to the University of Oklahoma as a high school sophomore to go take a summer school class ostensibly in computer programming and mathematics. But when I arrived, people came and knocked on my dorm room door and said, hello. Uh, they said, hi. I said, hello. And they thought, you must not be from around here because I use the word hello. You must be from Britain, so we'll call you British. And as it turns out, I was born in Cambridge, England, but only lived there for about two months. So I clearly do not have a British accent. Uh, I just didn't have a Southern draw. And so uh, that was good enough. That's what kicked off Lord British. Uh, and uh, I was a super hardcore D&D player for the first uh, decade of my career until I really began to move uh, much more heavily over into computer games. So uh, for those of you who uh, are computer gamers also, you may remember a, uh, a, little, a little series of games I made called Ultima. Uh, they were Ultima's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and online, uh, Ultima Online, uh, as well as a variety of spin-offs. And, uh, you know, I'm very pleased and proud that those uh, have uh, been, uh, uh, you know, made many of the firsts in gaming history, in computer gaming history. Things like the first, amongst the first, if not the first, computer role-playing game at all, first games in a box, uh, the invention of the word avatar, the invention of tile graphics, the invention of NPCs with schedules, the invention of interactive conversations, the invention of uh, games with virtues, of personality profiling to create your character. Uh, the list goes on all the way up through uh, the first MMORPGs, and I hope that with Shroud of the Avatar, we're creating some new firsts uh, that we can talk about a little later. But uh, but so computer gaming has really been my, my bread and butter, although I do have a, a little other activity too. I'm... I also just happen to be an astronaut. Uh, I uh, just uh, just took a little just why just, not? Just, just happen to be. Uh, <laughs> my father's also an astronaut, and uh, with the money that I've earned in computer gaming, I've invested in commercial space flight, uh, always with an eye to building a company that could take private citizens, including myself, which ultimately did work. So I'm one of six uh, private citizens uh, who have flown to space. But anyway, that's sort of me in a in a long nutshell. But. Uh, we can take it anywhere you'd like from there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, before we do, I wanted to, uh, we have a, a whole bunch of people following, uh, or checking us out, obviously, because this is being broadcast from the, uh, from the Twitch front page, so lots of people are going to be seeing this. A lot of people who, um, probably, probably are not familiar with how this show works, so let me just quickly run through it. Uh, and thank you for the host, guys. Thank you, Saladid, and, uh, Isvrata, and, uh, Crit Camp. Thank you guys so much. Um... For your for sharing our channel, uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna be hanging out for a little while. Uh, we're just gonna be chatting. We're gonna be talking all kinds of different dungeon master topics. Uh, think anything you know, things about role playing games and stuff in general, and 
you know, what, whatever, whatever kind of comes up, we're just going to be having a good time. Uh, that'll be for the first half of the show, and then, yes, uh, in the second half of the show, we are going to be opening it, uh, opening the floor up to, you know, to your questions, your topics, all that kind of stuff. So if you have questions, if you have anything you want to talk to, uh, talk to me or Rich about, uh, you know, ask about game gaming, ask about his career, ask about role-playing games in general. Save those for the second half when Dice Thulu tells you, and then we will be, uh, we will be getting on with that and taking care of, we'll try and get to everyone's question. Uh, we may have a lot of them, but we will, we will definitely do what we can to get to all of them. So, um, why don't we, uh, yeah, Quick Am says, how do you compete with I'm an astronaut? I mean, <laughs> I, look... It's no, really, I mean, it's no big deal. So what? You went, well, you go to space, okay, everyone goes to space, right? Yeah, well, you know, when I grew up, everybody that I knew did. My father was <laughs> My left-hand neighbor, Joe Engel, was an astronaut. Right-hand neighbor, Hoot Gibson, another astronaut. On the block behind me were all the Mercury and Gemini astronauts. So, uh, you know, it, it, it used to be pretty mundane until I, till I moved out, until I moved away from NASA and went to school and met all the Sesame Street people, as in the normal people. Yeah. Um, Shadzar is saying you can tweet your questions to at Askren. You can if you'd like to. Yeah, you can absolutely tweet me your questions. It's just twitter.com slash Askren. Uh, and I will be happy to um, to save those for uh, for later. Don't worry about it. You, you, There are a ton of ways you can get your questions in, and I promise we will do our best not to miss them. So um, I'm, let's, let's go back because I want to talk D&D stuff. Um, obviously you said, you said you kind of, you know, you, we were talking a little bit about how you were kind of present for D and D being created its inception and, you know, the first few iterations of it. Um, like where, how, how did you, how do you kind of, uh, how do you kind of become involved in it? Like, was it, was it something you just heard about people doing or did someone just kind of bring you this thing? Like, Hey, there's this new thing. Well, it was it was my sophomore year in high school when I went to this, as I mentioned, the University of Oklahoma for a summer program, and uh, the kids that arrived there ahead of me, they were going door to door giving everybody nicknames, specifically giving them their D and D names, and uh, of course, I, at this point, I had never heard of D and D, so that's when I, I not only received my nickname, uh, but then was immediately invited that evening into the games that we began to play every night. And so I had I had a seven week live in introduction to D and D, where uh, <laughs> frankly it was it was a pretty big uh, 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 it was a pretty mo- monumental uh, you know moment as a youth because as a high school se- uh, high school sophomore you're not only moving away from home for seven weeks but it's co-ed so you're you're living with similar high school boys and girls for and. Uh, in a dorm room away from your parents. And so everybody is, uh, you know, discovering all kinds of new things about relationships, about uh, independent activity when your parents aren't around to stop you from doing it. Uh, and of course, doing all this gaming in the evening is our social activity. And so it was a pretty hardcore introduction to the to the game and to the concept of social gaming. And then when I went back to my uh, regular high school and for my uh, junior and senior years, I actually became the, you know, local game master, you know, neighborhood game master home where, you know, we started with just one game kind of in the, around the kitchen table or in the living room table. But then the group grew fast enough, we began to split up and we'd have a game in the living room and the family room and the kitchen and the dining room. And then it got even bigger. And my mother used to have, she had previously turned our three car garage into an art studio. And we actually kicked her out of the art studio and then putting them in a bigger game in the uh, three-car garage. Uh, and so we were just playing all over the place. And all, and everybody's, all of our neighbors' kids' parents would come over and, like, cook food or hang out. Some of our teachers from school it was just going, like, where, where is everybody going on the weekends? And, you know, it, would, it was just, just kind of happening. But, but one of the things that was, I think, most magical about it was very quickly... This was also during a time when, um, you know, in addition to D&D, there were some other games that weren't nearly as popular, but it also came out about the same time. Arduin and Gamora, I'm missing pronouncing it. Uh, there were, uh, I mean, there was a Cthulhu game out. There was uh, a couple of others, most of which we didn't even know where we could find original copies of the instructions. So we all had mimeographed, pirated copies of some of these other games. And we would try these different rule sets, and pretty quickly... We all, at least for our, you know, group of 
of game masters, we sort of set the rules largely aside and began to do. We were very. We became rules minimalists, and I'm still a rules minimalist. And um, we would use the minimum amount of rules required to start doing this kind of interactive narrative where we'd kind of explore this reality together uh, to where, you know, if, if the players were doing something creative and smart and clever, you know, you'd, you'd roll dice behind your uh, uh, your little uh, DM board and uh, uh, DM shield and, you know, miraculously they would succeed. And if they were doing something boring or stupid, you know, tragically they would fail. And people would really pay ver fairly small amount of attention to the fundamentals of the, of the number crunching uh, in order to keep the story moving as a fast pace as possible. Yeah, uh, that's um, now. Th I mean, that's that's really interesting because again, I've uh, I know uh, AD like uh, basic, you know, OD and D those kind of things. I, I haven't had a chance to play them in a while, but they were. Um, I mean, they were fairly you know fairly loose narrative systems. Like they were not even remotely as crunchy as they are today. Um, no, I think that's true, but I but I think we've gotten better. You know, that's a, you know before we started today, there was something else we were chatting about was, um, you know, I my first three years of D and D, I, th I thought the whole concept was as 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 good as it's, as gaming could get. Mm -hmm. When I went to college, I had sort of the reverse opinion of the next kind of phase of D and D. There was a when I went back to to play five or ten years later later with the group that I had helped co-found. I then began to sit in on games where youngsters were coming up that would, you know, stand around and argue, well, I've got initiative and my character's on a rock that's three feet higher than yours, and so I get this extra plus for that, and, you know, I'm here on my character sheet, I've got another plus for this other thing, and they would argue for a while about the math of what the die roll should be, and then finally they'd roll a die and go either miss or hit. Yeah. And then they start the argument over again. Yeah. And I'm sitting there going like, oh my god, this is not gaming. This is you know spreadsheet management at its worst. Uh, and 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 so I think role playing games in general, not just D and D, but role playing games, kind of went through a dark time, which which kind of co coincided with the rise of computer games. And I'm not sure if there was any cause or effect, but I at least for a time, switched. I quit being a paper gamer, not just D&D, &D, but there was a period of time where paper games I found to be largely uninteresting. And uh, But what's been interesting to see happen is over the last at least five, and I would probably say probably 10 years for this last decade, so I've been doing this probably three decades, so you know, a good era, a bad era, now a good era again, games I think have come full circle. And I, you know, not only do I love playing D&D you know, uh, &D and other role-playing systems now, but just broadly, board games and paper games have just really gotten better. I mean, I just uh, I don't think it's just that I've gotten older and more tolerant. I mean, I really think the the designs mm -hmm. are literally better. They they you know we've figured out how to make complex things easy to digest. We get you yeah. just like in a computer game, you need to get into the action right away. Same thing's true in a paper game. You gotta you gotta communicate what you need to in a hurry, and let's get in and start playing and have some fun. So, uh, and and there's I, I want to delve in that delve into that for uh, real, uh, you know in a in a bit, but um, my friend uh, Arv Melleron, uh, who's another streamer, he streams D and D and some other stuff. Uh, he he stopped by and he actually um, he was he was he, uh, long message. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but uh, he said that he, he you know he works with Ed Greenwood, um, the creator of the Forgotten Realms, uh, which is D and D's current setting. Uh, and apparently, like he basically, he was talking with him about uh, Ultima, the the world that you created there, the the influence that that series and that kind of world had on what would become sort of the uh, the basic the main setting for D and D. Uh, and I I mean I'm first of all like do you find that kind of, like does that does that feel very like sort of roundabout in you know? Yeah, oh, it's, it's definitely very circular. Uh, but you know it's uh, but. But I love it. I mean, I think that's fantastic. I mean, it, you know, I, I think there's little anyone can aspire to than seeing, you know, than feeling a sense of uh, homage and reverence towards what gave you your start, and then seeing uh, the people who are continuing that great legacy uh, find find cause to go back and data mine from how, what you've built on top of what they had originally built. Uh, obviously, that's uh, a wonderful uh, bi-directional endorsement of sorts. I mean, it's a it's a great. Uh, uh, I think that's that's really fantastic, and 
uh, the fact that they found anything in my work that uh, helped them in their work is excellent. I mean, I, I just think that, like, I think it's really cool, like, it, you know, uh, obviously, because if you started playing D&D, did you, when you started playing D&D, like, did you have any, um, or I guess after, did you ever get a chance to, to play with uh, or, or, like, talk, kind of shop with Gary Gygax? I did. You know, it was actually not, it was not early in the Ultima series. It was actually later. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, uh, so what's interesting is, uh, uh, as has happened to me in my space endeavors too, there's this weird, there's this weird thing about meeting your heroes. Yeah. That, uh, that, uh, uh, and it and also depends on the context of meeting them. So when I went, when, you know, I'd had a couple of cursory meetings at like a Gen Con or an Origins or something, and, and those were... Uh, with me as the uh, young disciple coming to see, uh, you know, the person who really did this very fa- foundational formative thing, and and that's how they came across to me. That was and that was great. I mean, it felt it felt appropriate. But then there was a period of time when uh, they both were trying to do things. They were trying to do either do new gaming systems or, in particular, trying to break into computer gaming, which is sort of my expertise area. Yeah. And yeah. in that case their first endeavors into trying to cross over into computer gaming actually didn't go that well. And one of them uh, uh, was, uh, the, I think it was Gary, I think. Uh, might have been Dave. I'll, I'll have to recall here in a minute. But they were doing some work for EA and right after I sold my company to EA. And EA called me in to go, hey, Richard, what should we do with this game that uh, you know your buddies, the D&D founders, have been creating? Uh, and when I looked at it, I was going like, well, you know, it's actually it's probably not going to make it. And they were going like, okay, Richard, you can tell them. <laughs> I'm going like, wait a minute, you know, uh, I don't want that job. And uh, but and so so we sort of had the we had sort of the other direction occur. Uh, and but then you know a couple of years later, after we all the all of our gaming activities began to remerge again, uh, and uh, uh, you know games based on outside intellectual property, pe- people figured out how to do them right right. And uh, and so the D and D computer games also became uh, you know great in their own mind in their own right also. Yeah, I played I played some of those early D and uh, D computer games. They were they were very strange. Uh, but that's that may again it may be me because I was working uh, I was working back sort of backwards to them. Um, you know, coming from more modern role playing games and stuff like that, and then kind of trying to step my foot back. like because when I was a kid when I first played Ultima and stuff like they were not modern games. You know, they were they were much like they were much before my time so it was very um you know is my music done i'm sorry i don't know why i'm not hearing music um no it, but it was yeah a lot of those early D endeavors were very very um very strange i think they they kind of found their pace a little bit uh after a while um oh god i was just but i was i was gonna say and this is this is actually kind of an interesting segue um because i've heard for so long that you're when you were writing uh the original ultima games and you actually said this a little bit before um the original ultima games were based uh were based on your the D D campaigns that you played when you were uh back then so my question then becomes and i think other people have probably asked this before but like i've played ultima one two and three it's like if the if the if those are anything to go by, those D and D campaigns you played back then must have been ridiculous. <laughs> well, you know what's interesting though is uh, like I have up on my screen. I was going to hit print and print some stuff out to show on screen, but it, it, I think it make too much noise. But I have uh, I, what I am looking at is uh, my D and D campaign for uh, a campaign that I called a Calabeth, and. Uh, a Calabeth, of course, became my first the name of my first published game. Yeah. But the the Calabeth, my D and D campaign that I'm looking at, doesn't look much at all like the computer game. The computer game is dramatically simpler. You know the 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 the, the campaign a Calabeth that I'm looking at, you know, has a very specific purposeful map, whereas a Calabeth the computer make game is just sort of a randomly generated very mm-hmm. simple map. A Calabeth, the D&D campaign that I'm looking at here on my screen, you know, has rooms like the mortuary where, you know, it's laid out like a morgue and mortuary and things happen that would be appropriate to that. A Calabeth, the computer game, has, you know, random monsters, simple monsters wandering through a corridor. And and so, yes, they were inspired by, but the, t- the capabilities of a computer game were so feeble in contrast to what you can do when you can make it up in your head. So then the then the like the starships and the the uh, 
the space shuttles and laser guns. That that was that actually in the games, or was that was that just like added on after? Oh no! Well, so no, no, that was not in my D and D campaigns. So what you saw happen is. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know, one thing we didn't talk about is that I have, uh, here behind me, uh, so, Calabeth and Ultima 1 weren't my first computer games. I actually wrote 28 computer games prior to that, and they were called D&D 1 through D&D 28, and they were written on a teletype with the spools of paper tape, and, and these games were even simpler, so this, and, and you had to first write them out you know, on uh, in a notepad or you know, in a notebook paper. Uh, then you would type it in on the on the teletype and hope that it worked. Uh, you know, prior to them going, you know, completely offline, there was one I managed to hook up to a, a printer. So here's the the last uh, you know thermal paper fading slowly away of uh, my, my first game, D and D one. And then there was D and D two, D and D three, all the way up to twenty eight. Uh, prior to Akalabeth. And so those were all straight D&D. If you look at the character classes, if you look at the gear, you look at the relative cost of things, the kind of general approximation of damage, those were all straight D&D, as was Akalabeth and mostly Ultima 1. However, by the time I got around to Ultima 1, I was already kind of looking around a little bit farther. And so I began to you know, my favorite books at the time were, were uh, understandably uh, books like Lord of the Rings. But right about this I time, when I start publishing Wars. games in the late 70s, that's also the time of the emergence of Star Wars. Oh, yeah. And so even even though I was a big Star Trek fan all the time, I became an uber fan of Star Wars. And that's specifically where lightsabers and land speeders and things came from, you know, very obviously uh, from Star Wars. And then if you go to Ultima 2 with time travel, it's Time Bandits. You know, the, the, the cloth map and time travel came from the, the movie Time Bandits. And <laughs> Ultima 3, I don't even know what the, the other uh, things that were. But basically, anything I was consuming in mass media, I put in the games as much as it, was, as much as it fit the simplistic technology of those early games. It wasn't until Ultima 4 that I sort of said, okay, enough of this, uh, enough of this copying. You know, I need to uh, uh, figure out how to uh, uh, better uh, help. So, um, I mean, and, and that's 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 really interesting because, like, I was I, I you know I had heard that and I I'd assumed that the um, oh man that's getting really loud I'd assumed that the uh, the games were like all were were directly inspired like um, I see the way I, the way I figured it was like you know uh star wars star trek and stuff was coming out around that time and that fed into the D, &D which then fed into the computer games um I, I, because let's let's be real like i think all of us kind of hope that in our D, &D campaign at some point the dm is going to be like and you find a starfighter yeah and well and i'm a big believer that the best stories can equally well be told in a science fiction or fantasy setting you know, you know, if you were to try to tell, you know, like uh, some of my favorite Star Wars art is sort of the steampunk Star Wars art, but you could also do, you know, you could you could emulate this, the main plot of Star Wars in a medieval Lord of the Rings style environment, and vice versa, you could tell Lord of the Rings in a futuristic sci-fi, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, scene scenario, yeah. and so so yeah, so I, I would I would be happy to wander with my D and D campaigns. But uh, but my but it was really my computer games that were this kind of just shove it all in yeah. there up, up until Ultima Four. I honestly though, because here's here's the thing though, I I'm so glad it worked out that way because when I was a kid, again bear in mind I I, I mentioned this before, but I was like nine when I first played Ultima Two, and like I was walking around killing orcs as you do, and then I I I forget how it's like I went into the store and I stole a phaser and I'm like I could shoot things from like two spaces away. This is the coolest thing ever. And it was just, you know, you get so much money, and then it's like, I'm going to buy that Starfighter. It was, it seriously, it blew my mind as a kid, and I, I didn't know how to deal with it, and I just kind of dealt with it by meta metamorphosizing into this uh, ridiculous nerd of all stripes. Uh, also, I missed some um, ne uh, Neo Doodle and Smoke Bastard. Thank you for following. Welcome to the madness, my friend. Uh, 991, just nine followers away from that big 1K goal. Thank you guys so much. You're awesome. Drinking in your honor. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, like, is there anything... Um, 
I guess did like it's okay. So so let's let's trans let's take all that and kind of move to uh, to the topic of actually playing D and D. What um, where do you kind of like you you were a DM for a long time then. Where do you kind of consider yourself on the scale of of being a DM? Like there, there's like a like a seven axis grid that all DMs fall on. Like where where do you kind of um, where do you see yourself being? Do you do you prefer like more open ended stories or things that like in the hand control of the players, or do you like um, you know are you kind of a stri- a more narrative guy? I'm definitely. Uh, more of a narrative guy, but the way I would do it, and so I'm, I'll have to go look up this seven, uh, seven. I don't think it actually exists. It's just in my, it's in my head. All right. So, <laughs> but 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 I'm curious as to like in, in computer games, we we often talk about the Barbell four player types of explorers, achievers, mm-hmm. role players, and dissidents. You know, and uh, so I'll have to see how what I, how I think DMs you know uh, fall out. But I was definitely more of a. Uh, uh, narrative one, and but it's also interesting to see how that played out in contrast to the work I did to lay out scenarios, because you know what I found pretty quickly was as a as a dungeon master, I would lay out a full uh, detailed scenario, and I would try to build it logically. Like if you're going to invade an orc colony that would have a real structure to it. You know, they'd have a front, a guarded front door and maybe some mechanical means to seal it. And, you know, once you came in the front door, there'd be a logical structure of the pathway breakage. They'd, mm-hmm. you know, you'd have to, if you were marching armies in and out, they would go one direction. If you had prisoners you wanted to take off to the side to interrogate, there was probably a fork in the road. Uh, you know, the whole, the whole area had a logical structure, and I tried to create a variety of rooms that would be interesting, you know, within that structure. And usually a big goal to reach at the back, you know, defeat the leader or bring back some object or rescue a prisoner or whatever it might be. Uh, and then make each, give, give ideas as to why each individual room was interesting to be in beyond it having a monster. You know, to me, the worst game mastering ever was when you'd be walking down some corridors, you'd maybe make some branches, you'd come to a door, you'd eventually open it, and behind it you'd have an encounter of some monsters, and you'd kill all those monsters... You walk through the room, there might be two or three exits, and you repeat. And so a, a series of encounters is not interesting gameplay, mm-hmm. as far as I'm concerned. For me, it had to add up to something. It had to, uh, the way you got past the doors had to be interesting. If the door is locked, it's not just that the key's hidden on somebody's body nearby. It's, you know, if it's magically locked, you know, how are you going to undo this particular magic? The magic seal that is on this place. What magical stones are you going to find somewhere else in the building uh, or a structure to uh, to be able to open that up? Uh, but what I found is I would put all this work into setting all that up, and then people would only see a tiny fraction of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, no, would, that's it. They would either ignore it entirely, or uh, you know, or at the best, they would see you know, ten, five or ten percent of it. And so it took a few years of being a dungeon master to see how much detail is it worth me putting in up front instead of being looser about that detail and then having a few of those uh, puzzles Absolutely. in my mind to just arbitrarily shove in in front of them because it, it, if I had planned it out on the other half of the building, they'd never see it. And so I might as well just reassign it over here since I can do it magically without them paying attention. That was, um, and, and I mean, absolutely, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're definitely on the money. Like, um, one of the things I, I think a lot of DM, and I, cause I've, I've run the show for a long time now and I've answered a lot of DM questions. And one of the ones that comes up constantly is, you know, um, how do I, uh, how do I prep better? You know, how do I, how do I make my prep, uh, you know, I'm spending too much time on this and the players are just bypassing it or whatever. Um, and the, you know, the, the answer is always like, you have to you have to plan for the fact that you know when you're when you're running a game your players are going to make choices that you don't account for and sometimes like sometimes you put a you put a really cool puzzle or a really interesting piece of hidden loot in a room and they're just like they just pass right by cuz they don't even care you know or you you make an npc that has really cool dialogue or he's going to give them a really cool riddle or puzzle to solve or a hint and they just be like i'm not de- i don't want to deal with this guy i don't like his voice keep going you know and and so um you're right. You're absolutely right. I think a lot of DMs, when you get more experience, you become more comfortable sort of improving those things, putting them, you know, keeping them in your head. And uh, I, I've 
you know, I've very, very uh, quickly kind of become, especially when I do streaming, streaming has very much changed how I DM, um, especially because I'm not just doing it for my players, I'm now doing it to keep a group of viewers entertained at the same time. So you have to worry about pacing and the energy and how quick, you know, how things are moving. And so improv and learning to kind of learning what to what to plan and what to improv and what to um yeah and, and if I can solid. double down on something you're saying there too which is you know the uh, the the it sounds like we would both agree that it's it's uh, as much as the over planning can be uh, a waste of time mm -hmm. at, at best a waste of time it can actually be worse than a waste of time you can actually plan things that aren't fun yeah uh, oh yeah. And, uh, but, but the reverse is also bad, which is the, I'm just going to wing it. I really have no plan at all. And so I'm just going into a room. Then, then you, then you fall prey to a the sequence full of boo scares, uh, or the, you know, it really doesn't add up to anything. You can tell there's, there, that you're not managing the flow of the classical hero's journey of the rise and the fall of the, of the, the campaign. And so you, you really do need to think of, you know, how am I going to structure this as a campaign uh, and uh, to make sure I do get the right challenges in the right order uh, or at least the, the right highs and lows through that process. But then you need to be a little more fluid with the, hey, if they're going to bypass it over here, I'm just going to change the geometry of the dungeon they're exploring to make sure I get the cool thing in there in front of them where oh, we're yeah. going. Yeah, it's it's so um it's I think it's it's always a good tool to have in your back pocket is like uh to kind of to kind of houdini some things like if they never saw an enemy or a really cool enemy that you had per, you know you had made it's like I, I did this a while ago I made um I, I was running a game where the players were in this town and they were gonna do some some challenges to become champions of this religion so they could help overthrow a, another religion in the town uh, and one of the challenges I said they you know they could either do one thing or they could do another and the other thing was go into this cave and retrieve a sacred object pretty simple stuff and I had created this cave and I had created this really cool enemy it was like an underwater beholder basically uh, for my players to fight and they just chose not to do it they didn't go into the cave they didn't go anywhere near it they didn't even see it and so it was one of those things where it's like ah oh, well it really bums me out that I planned this cool you know this cool dungeon crawl and stuff for this session but they don't know what I planned, and so when I just take this monster and stick it in front of them later, they're not, you know, whatever. It's just gonna, it's gonna be just as cool. Exactly right, and but of course they don't want to know that you cheated, so it has to be, you know, yeah, the secret on the slide, GM, you know, method. Yeah, and I, I always tell people like that's why we DM behind a screen is because the the players should not really know that you're just making it up at like. As you as you go, because that you know their immersion, I think, comes from the fact that they think like you know all of this stuff. Like you're just you've just planned it all out. Exactly right. Um, so you uh, uh and uh, you know uh, people in chat uh, are are definitely agreeing. Shadzar says uh uh you know you have to DM for your players, not just kind of. Um, like when you 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 can't like not just the generic idea of a player, you know. Oh, if I put a, a trap in front of them, and th this is the same thing. Like um, I've learned in my, uh, and I, I want to, I definitely want to know if you've learned anything like this too. Um, I've learned in my career as a DM, uh, as kind of a storyteller, there are certain things that I just can't really do because players never really react to them the right way. Traps tend to be one of them. Um, is like whenever, especially the ones that's like, oh, you you weren't looking, you step on it and a spike goes through your foot, take fifteen damage, and like. It will always cause an argument. It will. The players will never be no, like, no, I, "Oh, I agree. shucks." Well, <laughs> well, let me tell you even how I internalize that, which is, uh, I'm sure you remember at least I was, one of my memories of the early days of D and D, when you had the trap that could be sprung on somebody, and the, or how you would avoid it. And so, what people would have to do to truly avoid it is every move, yeah, they would tap on the ground with their ten foot pole, and every move they would do a detect traps or detect secret doors. And that, of course, is completely boring, uninteresting, and a waste of their time to be doing it literally every move. Mm -hmm. And then, so then, conversely, it's unfair to them to just go sprung a scrap trap gets sprung on you. And so, the way I solved that in the computer games, because I think it was interesting. Once I started writing computer games, some of these things are illuminated to you in great detail. Yeah. For example, you know, my first game, Calabath, includes six attributes: the standard original six, you know, strength, dexterity, and intelligence, plus also constitution, wisdom, and uh, charisma. And when you write a computer game, of course, you are, you know, in the case of swinging and wielding a weapon, you might lean on strength and dexterity. 
and maybe at the one shopkeeper subroutine, you may or may not test, you know, intelligence and or charisma. But that's about it, right? You're not, you know, I, there was really no test in the game for wisdom. There was, there was no event that drew upon wisdom. And so why have it? And if you only, and instead of making up one, you know, you could say that my intelligence is sort of a measure of how wise I am. And then when you realize you're not really leaning on charisma in any real way, you go, well, my intelligence can sort of be related to my charisma if all I'm really using it for is, is, is negotiating with a shopkeeper. And so you realize it forces you to realize exactly how many times you're actually referencing any of those attributes. Yeah. And therefore, you know, the ones that are literally a waste of time. And so I that drove me to being a true minimalist. And it also drove me on back on the trap subject to the following. You know, my first games did have a search for secret doors and search for traps. But even as a playing somebody playing my own game, I'm going, I'm never going to find them. I'm either going to fall in the hole. Yeah. Or because it's just it's just not worth it to take a step, search for traps. Take a step, search for traps. I'm going, I'm not going to do it. And so I said, what would be better is for me to make the actual trap look minusculely different than the corridor without the trap. Or the secret door look minusculely different yeah. than the corridor without a secret door. And so now it really is truly up to your perception. I mean, it is literally your perception. And so I think that if you're doing it on paper... The rules need to be written or the game master needs to interpret it as I know everyone in the team's general abilities to 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 make these kinds of detections and I will keep that in my pocket to decide if and when any of them happen to see one and statistically that would be the person who has the better perception. Yeah. Yeah, it's um it's and actually uh it's something that you can easily interpret you can like uh for example, I I've talked about there's a couple of guests cuz some some of my guests are game designers. Uh, some of them are, have designed both video games and uh, and role playing games, um, and we talked about the fact that one of my 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 favorite and my least favorite thing in D and D has always been the Tomb of Horrors. It's my favorite dungeon. I loved you know I love working with it. I think it's sort of a master class in uh, in in designing a, a dungeon that sort of teaches players while punishing them. But the problem is exactly what you said: is that all of the rules that it teaches the players about uh, how to how to navigate it are the ones that are the most boring. And so, like they learn very quickly in the first hallway, they learn not to trust what they're told. They learn how to you know how to kind of that this this dungeon will lie to them. Uh, this music is very epic for this conversation. Um, the uh, no, they but they learn they learn a lot about that and. The problem is, like, it does teach them that if you want to get through it, you have to sort of tap on every surface with your 10-foot pole, every single square, and that just, you know, it just slows things down and it makes things so uninteresting that, like, that's my major problem with it, is, like, I'd love to, I'd love to run a very similar experience, but in a system that is far more streamlined and interesting, uh, that allows the players to have some measure of control over, you know, but what's I going on around them. You know, but I also think that that's why you know certain you know, certain experiences will always be better in one or another um, play format, and so the fact that we can visualize an environment on a computer game means that we can hide things like traps and secret doors yeah. with an actual visual clue, and then it's just up to you to figure it out. Um, you know, that's one thing. That, that's one of the rare places a computer game can actually beat a so a good game master. I actually think when push comes to shove, a good game master can create a far more unique, far more compelling, far more customized experience mm -hmm. than you can through a computer game. Uh, you know, we, we still struggle. I at least still struggle. I, you know, I, I, to this day, I think that my very best computer games have only scratched the surface of my own yet even zero of the surface of some of the best date game masters I've played with. Uh, that their interactive storytelling and interactive, you know, mood setting uh, and, you know, participatory exploration is far deeper when you are unfettered by the pre-planned three-dimensional reality of a computer game. But there are other areas where the computer game, you know, uh, it wins. And, uh, and that includes not only things like your ability to actually detect hidden things by what you're actually perceiving um but uh but could even go down to things like um uh uh you know uh, th things like the moon gates or things like the virtues hiding you know the 
letting the game really keep track of things behind the scenes in ways that would get, a game master would have trouble doing, the karma that we use in a lot of our games. Those are things that would be hard to game master in, uh, in a live environment, but the computer game it can excel at. And so different, different kinds of experiences, I think, are pushed for me into two different play environments. Yeah, um, that's and that's actually interesting because what you what you're saying is what like, um, this this has been a conversation that I've been I've taken part in once or twice, but it has raged online for as long as I can remember, and it's like, uh, if you know if you're playing if you're playing an RPG on your computer, um, you can and you're sort of expected to leave uh some things up to the player's actual skill, like because. Because a, a video game is sort of that's the idea of a video game. Like it's it's based on the player's skill in you know to complete. But a role playing game is slightly different. For example, because in a video game you don't have to physically talk to a shopkeeper in order to convince him to uh, to give you a discount or something like that. But in a role play like in a, around a table you do you know. Um, and so like does as a DM do you like. Uh, does a player's ability to, for for example, give a rousing speech, uh, like his physical ability to do that, uh, n does that override his need to roll a skill check to see whether he can do that? Or should, you yeah. know... Well, it's interesting you should mention that one, because that, that makes me think of something else I was uh, pulling out uh, ahead of uh, our uh, conversation, which is, uh, you know, I would argue that both in a live game and on the computer game, you are you are leaning on the physical skills of the player. Computer games often will le lean on the physical dexterity skills of a player. And in fact, I'm actually not a huge fan of that. I, I don't do much of that in my own games, even in the PvP sections, uh, or to the degree there, 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 there is true dexterity skill, that's when I lose. I'm, I am not, I will not win the games that are first person shooter style uh, physical dexterity wins. But like you noted, we are doing intelligence tests uh, on both sides. And while a computer game won't ever do the can you give a rousing narrative because that's a lot to parse in a computer game, you know, I would still argue that you know, I, in my computer games, I put clues in in Runic. And unless you sit down and read it, you are not going to get the clue. Period. And it really pisses off a bunch of my computer gaming players mm -hmm. who, 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 who's cry, you know, foul play, it's too hard and I'm too wimpy a player to do it. Sorry if I've just defended a bunch of my players. But, uh, <laughs> but the, uh, but back even in the D and D game, you know, my early D and D games, I would have people create, uh, art and, uh, and runic, uh, you know, uh, uh, tomes in order to earn advancement and uh, to earn social advancement within the game. And so, and I've kept all this down through uh, down through the years. And uh, uh, oh, this is kind of cool. I'm also finding things like you know, just how, how deep my D and D games go. Like for example, and and back to Lord of the Rings. This, the, the only ring I happen to have on my fingers right now because I, I, I injured a finger, so I had to take off my wedding ring recently. But uh, but the other ring that I wear goes back to my D and D campaigns where we actually made these three rings. We literally made them out of silver, and I've had them on you know for the rest of my my time. But it really goes back to my D and D campaign. So there's, you know, back to back to the 70s, and uh, but yeah. But anyway, there's just I just have pages and pages of of this stuff that the players had to had to make, and then of course I had to make my own. So here's one that even goes back to here's uh, you know swords and spaceships. How did that happen? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and even figuring out how to write Lord British properly in the lands of Caesarea. So this is a you know all this. Or, or uh, you probably want, you probably can't see this one. I'm gonna see if I can get it to a place where you can. Looks like a blank sheet of paper until I get it in the right angle of light. It's actually written in white ink that can only be read in certain reflections of the light. Um, <laughs> you know, so I, I, you know, and those were those were clues that I used, you know, in uh, in some of the dungeons and uh, games. So, so yeah. So this is a. Uh, I I think that these sort of intellectual challenges are great both in paper gaming and in computer gaming. But they but they have a different spin as to which ones they can do well. That's I mean, I'm I'm absolutely I I'm enamored with that stuff because I love um my like for example, my my players in my current game got a uh, a tome like it was a a dark like a tome that was written in Aklo, which is the language of the Shadow Realm and uh 
they can't read it, but they wanted to, they needed a ritual from that tome. And so I, because I happen to have a background in graphic design and illustration, like I love just going into Photoshop and like writing out, you know, and drawing like Thulu like to pictures and stuff like, and making handouts like that. But I, I've never gotten so deep as to make like actually draw out puzzles and things that they need to solve mostly because I know my players would throw a fit if if I did um but it's it, it's definitely something I I would love to get into because it looks like it honestly I think it's just like that that stuff is that stuff's always kind of been my my milieu I agree and it, but it also takes time and it, and it's not the best for everybody like uh there was a, a friend of mine one of the other bearers of these three rings uh you know a uh, guy named Bob White and he was another uh, he was another game master in uh, uh, back in my home back in high school, and if there was one person whose storytelling I was jealous of, it would be Bob. And uh, he was always doing these much darker Cthulhu esque kind of storytelling pieces that he would set the mood for. And you know you you would you would go buy one of his games going on. And you would really believe there was something dark and sinister looming in my dining room of my house because he <laughs> he he physically set the mood so well and he led the story so well and he could he his personal role playing kind of imbued this sort of mischievous Cthulhu darkness and uh, uh, and and th and there were times I was you know uh, I'm not I'm not even sure this was real or or imaginary scared you know to go past that room when he was game mastering it was really good and so uh uh you know everybody has their own style everybody has their own ways and that's what i began to really appreciate about game masters even in those early eras and then i and and in fact this maybe bears uh, some going going back to this kind of dark period that i mentioned the second decade of gaming of, of role-playing games where it became all number crunching and no storytelling uh spreadsheet management and no storytelling the what I think happened personally is the earliest adopters of D and D were the ultra hardcore storytelling nerds that had never been tapped before and found their way into something they they loved in this passionate way before. And so the early adopters were you know every fifth person that w that came into our group was a really good storyteller when when made these really great campaigns. But as it became more and more popular, you sort of run out of great storytellers, and you, you, you naturally have to lean on the rules more. And so, and the rules in those early days, I think, were just insufficient. I think they were way too complicated. Uh, a lot of the rules were, frankly, useless, or in fact, impeded fun. They needed to be ignored or broken. Uh, but if you weren't a good storyteller and didn't have that sense of confidence, then you would lean on the rules again. In my mind, much too heavily. And so that's why I think role playing kind of cr got crushed under its own weight. It was too successful for its own good when the rule sets were still inadequate to 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 help beginners in that way. And and modern systems have fixed that. The rules are better, the guidance is better, uh, and we've gotten back to getting the better game masters on top of games again. Yeah, and I I think uh, I think it, it's summed up in no better than my favorite my current favorite game. Uh, which is Big Motherfucking Crab Truckers, um, which is the best role-playing game that I think has ever been written. Uh, and it's... Um, because it, it, it really has no... It has only one rule. And the rule is no fucking way. That's the rule. Is you say no fucking way, and then you roll to see who's right. <laughs> it's seriously... Well, I've just Googled that, and I'm going to get me a set, so... Uh, Do it! I'm going to have to check Absolutely. Out. Play big motherfucking crab truckers. You can. There are videos of me. Um, I, I've been. So my friend Ivan Van Norman on Geek and Sundry uh, has been kind of championing, championing, championing that system. And I, uh, I picked it up and I've run a few, um, a few games of it on my friend's channel. But it's, it's such a fun experience. I've never done it without like the whole room being dying la like in stitches uh and before uh anyway before we we're gonna go into questions in just a minute because we're coming up on the top of the hour but i have for i forgot to do this and i i definitely want to thank uh nalesha and ender delfiki and alex Wiz and i whoop you cyphoria for following welcome to the madness my friends sorry uh if i missed you guys before but thank you for joining us 
Um, we're coming up on the top of the hour, so thank you to everyone who is joining us here from the Twitch front page. You guys are awesome, and thank you for hanging out with us. Uh, you are watching the Fuzzy Dice Show, Fuzzy Dice the DM Show, your Dungeon Master Show here on the Exploding Dice channel. My name is Askren, I'm your host and Dungeon Master, and this is my friend Lord British, and we are, we are just having a good time talking about everything and anything related to role playing games. So at the top of the hour I'm going to tell you guys we're going to um we're going to start taking some questions from you. You can throw out anything you want, uh questions about D&D, &D, questions about uh you know video games or uh or Richard's career. Uh you can um uh, you know, you can just ask us weirdly personal questions if you want. And uh, also, while uh, while we're doing that, yeah, I know you uh, totally forgot you had a book that uh, that you've been writing, and it's coming out very soon. Yes, well, in addition to Shroud of the Avatar, which of course I ha uh, love to plug as well, the game we're working on right now that people can already join us in uh, uh, kind of a, a, a pre-release state. Uh, it'll be out later, uh, you know, kind of mid-year next year sometime. Uh, but I also have a book coming out January 10th, Explore and Create, sort of my, and it's a book sort of about my belief that uh, what has helped me be a, a good creator follower. of virtual worlds is to be a, uh, a passionate explorer of the reality in which we live. And so it's stories, it's stories that go back and forth between stories about exploration to stories uh, about creating virtual worlds. Uh, absolutely, and I, I, um, I've actually been uh, trying. I've been keeping up a little bit because I know you've been talking about that a lot on Twitter. But I will definitely endeavor to pick myself up a copy when that is out because, obviously, it just looks really, really cool. Uh, and while we're, um, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna say, you guys, uh, if you want to throw some questions out in chat, just exclamation point fuzzy, and Dice Thulu will tell you all about it, uh, about how you can ask your questions. If you tag me, you just do at exploding dice. Uh, I will be able to see them right up front, and then you can, uh, you can, you know, we'll we'll get to them. Uh, so, if you want to, uh, if you want to tell us a little bit about uh, like Shroud of the Avatar and kind of where that, um, you know, what's the story behind that? Because I I've been keeping up with it, and I've been follower. fighting the urge to, uh, to 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 spend some money and get in on it because I've been looking for a yeah, new well, so game. Well, so of course, you know, uh, as we were discussing, you know, I go back to the pre-beginning. So I've, I've started writing medieval fantasy worlds, uh, you know, right on the heels of the launch of the paper game Dungeons and & Dragons. And uh, for the first decade or two, uh, uh, I played them, uh, you know, or, or I created them on uh, uh, an Apple II. I created the series called Ultima for many years, but then uh, uh, ultimately that company... Uh, my first company, Origin, was sold to Electronic Arts, and I, where I stayed for a decade. But after that, we've kind of gone out of, on our own. And what, when we went on our own, we we spent some time doing games that were not medieval fantasy. Just to say, man, for 20 years we've been in doing the same repetitive medieval fantasy stuff forever. Let's take a break. And so we did sort of some uh, sci-fi kind of stuff, including this game called Tabula Rasa. Uh, and we uh, helped uh, the, another team that we were working with doing uh, superhero games and things really all over the map. But uh, now with our new company, Portalarium, we've circled back to our roots, and we're making what is really fundamentally the spiritual successor to the Ultima series. So I don't own the name Ultima, uh, so I can't call it an Ultima, but if you think about the Lord British design principles, which have gone into all of the games that I've made, and especially those that you know, were in the medieval worlds that I've created, it's clearly solidly in that space. Uh, and so players of Ultima Online or old folks who played even the earlier games, such as yourself, uh, you'll, you'll d definitely recognize <laughs> the uh, pedigree uh, of Shroud of the Avatar. And, uh, but yet I also think we're, we're adding in some great new things. In addition to being state-of-the-art you know, uh, game creation, there's some things that about the recent state-of-the-art we're avoiding. Like I hate games with asterisks over people's head to tell you what the, this is somebody you need to talk to. I hate follower. arrows on the map that you follow along on the quest log to tell you where to go. So we've eliminated that. And we've created a game that instead of creating shards where everybody is separated into copies of the reality, we have everybody playing in a unified reality. And the game kind of throttles up between massively multiplayer and down to solo player in real time as it feels that it needs to or as the player wants to. And so uh, it's a it's sort of a new structure of a multiplayer game wrapped with all of the virtue stories and all of the 
uh, interdependent roles uh, that uh, Ultima Mind championed. Uh, and so it's we'd, we'd like to believe that it's sort of the best of all worlds of solo player and massively multiplayer uh, role-playing games. Yeah, but, abso- know, up to you absolutely. And the, uh, the, the link is in the chat, so if you guys want to go check that out, please do. Uh, it's in, I think it's still in development. It's in early access, right? Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. it'll be, we've... Uh, We've been releasing it now for, in fact, we're up to release 36, so it's three years now of releases. We've released it since it was a nascent product. Literally, as soon as we had an avatar in a room with a chair and a torch and a chicken, we called it the chicken room. Uh, Since the chicken room, we have been live, and uh, any backer has been able to play from when there was literally nothing to do but sit in a chair, turn on and off a torch, and kick a chicken. Uh, That was basically all you could do in month one. And it's gotten better and better ever since, we like to think. That is awesome. And thank you so much, uh, Chi Boom and Spike Forever and Jared M1819 and Black D20 for following. Welcome to the madness, my friend. Thank you for joining us, guys. Uh, we are so glad to have you. Uh, so we have some questions rolling in, and I definitely want to get to them. So while we, while we discuss these, feel free to shoot your questions in chat. Uh, just... Tag it with at exploding dice to make sure I see it all highlighted and bright on my screen. A new um, follower. Calavan says, uh, Richard Garriott, I have played and finished every Ultima game released. Lord British rules. Great work and amazing legacy. That's not a question, but I, I felt like it was worth reading. Well, and what was the gentleman's name? Because uh, as you may know, in every Ultima, I ask people to report their feet. And when they do, I send them a congratulations uh, modernly in whatever method they have used to send me <laughs> their report. So I need to congratulate this person on air for having reached me on air. Well, that is uh, Cavalon, C-A-V-A-L-A-N. Cavalon, then. Cavalon, Lord British, is uh, deeply in your debt, as are the people of Britannia, for not just once, but for, but for repeatedly saving our people and our lands. For that, we are deeply indebted, and I thank you and hope you will join us in our future adventures. That that is awesome. That is uh, I, that is definitely a his, a thing that I am going to clip for the channel because uh, <laughs> we well and you know and that, what's really funny about that is uh, as I was just writing up some bug reports yeah. here as we call them uh, about uh, the fact that you know behind me on this table uh, these are literally uh, envelopes I was bringing back from the office and I'm sorting them away uh, to file them away but they are the report by feats that go back to the very earliest games. Uh, in fact, uh, if I see find that, uh... If, if those are your, if those are your letters about people who finished Ultima, then it means that it's somewhere in that pile, you probably have my a letter from when I was 11 years old. Uh, well, I have it all. It, I literally have kept every piece. And <laughs> then, so, uh, My letter is somewhere in there because I got a certificate. It's up in my attic right now. <laughs> then, yeah, then, it, then it's here. You know, but, the, but I have to then tell you, though, about one, about one person who... Uh, would not only write in to report their feet and, and and say how much they enjoyed the game once they finished it, but whenever they would get the game, the next game, they would write letters about how much they hated it. And so <laughs> this this person's name is Donald Glinky, who sadly I don't think is on Earth anymore uh, because we eventually called him and he was about 80 years old back in 1984. But for example, here is Donald Glinky's letter about Ultima 3. Ultima 3, you've got the dumbest damn game in the world here. Ultima 2 is such a good game. How did you ever let some freak halfwit come up with this piece of crap for a follow-up game? It will forever be a mystery. I've had this thing for six months, and I can't make any progress. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, this game stinks. You know, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, anyway, we, these are all Donald Glinky letters, and uh, <laughs> this particular file is... Uh, it, it always starts with, I've just got the game, and it's terrible. And he bitches and moans and bitches and moans until he finishes it. And then when he finishes it, he writes a letter like this one, which this one says, Great! Put me on your list for the prepayment and shipment of the next one. Do any time. Like now. Let, anyway, <laughs> so it's, uh, he, was, he was one of our favorites. Oh, man. Donald that, that, he, has an entire, he has an entire file to himself. That is awesome. That sounds just like a player who, like, uh, when you're in a game, like, when, when they're in those tough fights, they're just sitting there like, oh my god, this we can't possibly win, this is, you you know, the DM is trying to kill us, and he, you know, this game sucks, and then it's like, they, uh, you know, the, the, like, the session ends, like, alright, so same time next week? 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is awesome. Um, uh, Montuxia says, did you name an NPC after him? I don't, I, I hope you did. Oh, Donald Glinky. He has been in the game off and on in the past, but we definitely <laughs> should put him in again. Uh, I will write a Jira about that right now. That is awesome. Uh, oh my god, and thank you so much uh, to Jnix uh, and Ratchosphere for following. Welcome, my friends! Thank you for joining us, and welcome to the madness. Um, so, question, uh, we got a question earlier from Jared M. He says, what, uh, what would you feel is the best way to introduce new players and pull them in to, uh, sorry, I can't, it's hard for me to stay on a thing here, uh, and pull, I guess, how would you, how would you pull someone in to role-playing games in general who has minimal or no experience? Yeah, you know that's interesting because I, you know, I've I've done that off and on down through my life. You know, uh, you know, there's people we meet through role playing that, of course, kind of get it, and and you don't need to tell or show. And then there's everyone else, <laughs> which which often means, uh, you know, your business associates that aren't in the game industry, or you know, potential girlfriends, or in this case, my wife, uh, you know, who don't have a, a a big gaming background, and so when they when somebody comes in and they, they don't have a bank gaming background, they think of role-playing as something that is very big, something obtuse, something strange to do. And so what I use, and, and, and which, of course, I think is wrong, I actually think that role-playing is actually quite simple at its, at its base level. It's not something you... You don't need a character sheet to role-play. You don't need uh, dice. You don't need uh, any story background. Uh, and so what I usually do when somebody says, you know, I'm just not into this role-playing thing or don't understand it or, or what is it, I usually sit down and say, okay, well, let's, we're going to role-play right now. And I, I sit down and say, okay, well, let's suppose, you know, you, you were out uh, walking along the road and, uh, you know, uh, you, you see you've, it's a road you've traveled many times, but this time you, you see something you never saw before, which there's a, like a big opening in the side of a, of a hill that you walked by many times before, and it, your curiosity piques your interest, so you walk over to the, the front of it, but it's dark inside. Uh, what do you do? And, I, and that's it. So I try to give them a completely minimalistic setup to a, an experience that is a change from something they might actually be doing on an actual day. But very quickly, I'm going to figure out, you know, if they can, well, if they begin to ask questions like, do I have a flashlight with me or a lighter in my pocket or some matches or is there anything that I can light a fire? Or if they're going to be try to go, go give, give up. You know, I'm gonna, and if they if they are gonna try to give up, I'm gonna try to find a way to entice them back in, and uh, and then I'm gonna take them on a two or three room, little role playing adventure of something with some, uh, you know, I'm not gonna necessarily have monsters and swords and magic, but I'm gonna I'm gonna at least let them let them understand that this is a mental exercise between you the player and me the storyteller to lead you into something that you find entertaining uh, and hopefully even meaningful at some level. Uh, to you, when you when you think about it, I think the um those original uh kind of question like uh the the virtue questions in the beginning of Ultima were were sort of served that purpose in a very interesting way because they basically were exactly that. It's you know saying you are you're in this situation. What do you do? And it kind of forces even someone who's never role played before to say to put themselves in their shoes. And say, well, what would I do? You know, and and work it out. Yeah, you know what's interesting about that too is I, I got that those virtue stories, the virtue questions, you know, there's eight virtues and with four questions you can narrow it down to four, two more questions, and the final question. So seven questions, you can do like a, ba a base basketball bracket and kind mm -hmm. of come up with a pyramid of, of which virtues you favor. But what I wrote that about, uh, or my inspiration, was actually a story that my oldest brother was in medical school and there was a psychology test that he was yeah. given. That, that I will now give you, and because uh, it's so brief, it's a it's a story about five people. Uh, first ones are Olive Oil and Popeye, and they love each other but live across a dangerous river from each other. And so Olive Oil, who wants to see Popeye, can't get there, and so she goes to see Brutus, who lives on her side of the river, and says, "Brutus, you have a boat. Can you take me across?" He says, "Sure, I'll take you across, but only if you sleep with me first. So she says, "Thanks, but no." Goes to see Wimpy, who has a boat. And he said, Wimpy says, well, I'm not even getting involved, so, you know, sorry, I'm not going to help. No one else has a boat, so she goes back to Brutus, sleeps with him. Brutus takes, him, takes her across the river. She, ha she confesses to Popeye, I'm very happy to be here to see you, but I have to say that I 
had to sleep with Brutus in order to get passage over here. At which point in time, Popeye spurns her and goes, you know, you slut, I don't ever want to talk to you again. Uh, she's, of course, distraught. She goes to see Sweet Pea, who's on this side of the river, tells the whole story to Sweet Pea, and Sweet Pea goes and beats up Popeye. And now that you've had this story told to you, your job, and I'm going to ask you this right now, is tell me who in this story did the worst thing, and tell me who in this story did the least bad thing. Um, I, th I think the worst thing would probably be... Uh would probably be Brutus because uh, because a I mean blackmail follower. is just pretty you know pretty out there and I think the least worst thing would probably be uh, would probably be Popeye uh, the least worst so that's interesting now what's interesting is women um, statistically if you ask this question they more commonly find olive oil guilty of doing something terrible mm -hmm. men more commonly do find Brutus guilty of doing yeah. something terrible uh Popeye often is seen as a good guy. Uh, no, excuse me. Uh, uh, Sweet Pea is often seen as a good guy, having done actually something good. But a lot of people also will defend Brutus, going like, "Look, he made his. He he didn't. He only. He didn't. He, he didn't. You know, though he had. She had other options. He wasn't the only one with the boat. You know, he was the only one. He just. He he laid out his uh, offer, and she took it. And so uh, the the point is, there's tons of ways you can. Parse yeah, this. yeah, yeah. And, and that was the first time, and of course there's no right or no wrong, there's no best choice or worst choice, uh, and it depends a lot on what you have, what's happened to you in your life and ways you've been hurt in your life. A new uh, And so that was my first time I realized you can take fundamentally right and wrong issues and contrast them against each other in a way that is interesting. And then I started breaking follower. it down for the eight virtues. Was, now, does that... Does, uh... Was that sort of the direct idea? Um, and this, I only want to touch on this briefly because we got a, a lot of questions to get through. Uh, but was that sort of idea of um, of taking these ideas, like these kind of good and evil ideas, or these these sort of morally gray things, and then m twisting them and kind of contorting them? That uh, were were those like, were you really as interested in playing with those as as Ultima four, five, and six seem to kind of, uh, you know, that seemed to be the central focus of all of them? Well, you know, once, uh, you know, it's interesting, once when I started on Ultima 4, uh, it was right after we published Ultima 3 as the first game my own company, Origin, published. Mm -hmm. Which means it's the first time I got letters like the ones behind me here. And it was interesting to see what I interpreted out of those letters. People were saying, first of all, uh, you know, it's always one paragraph of I liked your game and it's 10 pages of let me tell you how to do your job better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, but then I also noticed that what most people were doing is they were killing and stealing and doing all of these nefarious activities. They were min maxing their path to become the great hero. And uh, and when they did that, uh, they also weren't not only were they being morally ambiguous, but the bad guys weren't doing anything particularly bad. They were waiting for you yeah. at the final level to come kill them. They were they were. People were talking about the fact that they were bad guys, but there was no evidence that they were bad guys, especially nothing happening that was changing the state of the world. And so, uh, 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 so when I started working in Ultima 4, it was interesting to see how everyone around me in my own company thought I was being an idiot. They said, Richard, people are writing you letters telling you how much they enjoy killing your villagers and stealing from your shops, and you are about to stop them. And you're about to basically run off all the players that you've ever had. And uh, and I, I believed very strongly in what I was doing and said, you know, screw it, this is the way I'm going. And Ultima 4 became the first number one best-selling game in the series. And I have found that in every game that we do, including Shroud of the Avatar, that when, when I let someone talk me out of that sort of hive concept, that larger vision for the game, that it usually turns into mud and uh, you know it's it, it loses it, it loses any vision uh and i think it becomes less than what it could be and on the times where i go you know i'm less i'll listen to your critique i'll listen to your concerns but if you haven't persuaded me then this is still the target yeah. that we're shooting and uh and that's sort of i've lived by you know ever since and i think that has served uh, at least me and hopefully the projects uh well since and uh but when you, you were specifically asking about five and six and so what I've had to do, starting after four, with, but especially with five and six, is 
learn how do I take storytelling? How do I take this Joseph? I mean, I'd never heard of Joseph Campbell and the Fear of a Thousand Faces and the standard you know, storytelling arcs until Ultima Four. That's when I began to read and try to become a, an actual, uh, a well-educated storyteller, not just an instinctual storyteller, but one who was a student of storytelling in this new medium that had hither before never existed. And so I, in my most optimistic view of myself, I would like to believe that I have, uh, you know, uh, figured some of these rules out. I've helped set some of these standards mm-hmm. that are now being picked up by other developers about how to a how to create follower. avatars that are the player themselves and take them on these journeys that really are deeply personal and really do allow you to grow as an individual through the experience. Which, by the way, as I ever go back to, you know, to the degree that I ever go back and do paper gaming as a game master, I will do that there too. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, again, uh, just uh, really quick, because I, I do want to get back to these questions, but I think it was it was probably Ultima Five. I think, that really um, really taught me how to... Um, how to sort of how to sort of write uh, villains that are you know kind of have have complexity to them like uh, and they don't all all have to be like the same like oh this is a guy who is you know he believes really strongly in this religion and and uh, so much so that he becomes kind of like a fundamentalist terrorist in his own country but it was it was a very interesting study in how to do like villains that were like you could understand the nexus of their uh, their evil. And it was, you know, it's it's influenced a lot of my writing. Uh, man, follower. so many, uh, so many people. I want to thank before I go to the next question. Uh, thank you so much, Bearded Mac Dog and VRN One Thirteen and Light Seth and Average Joe 122, and Cavalon and Wildfire, and Montuxia, and the Lecherous, and also Voltaic UO. Thank you guys for following. Uh, Firebringer Axel says, uh, 1K has come and gone. Yeah, I don't know why that's, uh, why that's not up again. What's going on, Bird vs. Plane? But we have absolutely crushed that 1K goal, so before I move on to the next question, I'm going to finish this beer, and I'm going to tell you that you guys have helped uh, help make happen our first 24 hour stream on this channel. And I am, I couldn't be happier about that. Uh, I'm so looking forward to, um, bringing it to you guys. So thank you all for joining us. I hope you guys have been enjoying the show. And, uh, I, I seriously, your support is amazing. Um, so there is, let's, Oh, I'll definitely talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I, I, you guys have sent so many questions. I, I need, I like, I feel like I need to get through these. Um, Oh man. Uh, so um, r- let's see if we can hit this real quick. Uh, Defrogotten says, uh, "What is your favorite non-commercial and uh, or indie RPG?" Uh, well, okay. So indie would be the way to describe it because uh, I'd probably only see it if it was commercial. I mean, I play on the Ultima Online gray shards. I guess those are completely non-commercial. Uh, but, uh, but my first, uh, uh, you know, one, one of my favorite completely indie games, I'm going to try to pull it up here, uh, you know, on my, I, I do a lot of gaming now on my iPhone and, uh, and so one of my favorites I'm going to bring up here, it is called a dark room and you're going to see the amazingly high tech graphics. Those are the amazingly high tech graphics of this a game. And, uh, uh, it is a. You know, to call it retro would be uh, you know, an understatement. Uh, and uh, uh, and I only play a game to completion. You know, one game follower. or maybe two games a year. And uh, that is one that I was uh, particularly enamored with. Played it from start to finish, uh, and uh, it remains on one of my you know triple A best games ever, and is completely indie. I was muted. Uh, probably uh, one yeah, of the, there you go. Yeah, I got it. Hold on. Let me drink. Drinking rules say you have to drink when you're muted. <laughs> mm. No, one of my uh, one of my favorite RPGs that I've been playing recently, and I just played number four, I think it was, um, is this little. It's like a text based uh, role playing game called. Um, uh, it's on. It's like a. You're. It's kind of like a mobile game, but it's also on Steam, called uh, Sorcery. And it's just this really well follower. written, really interesting little like I've always been I've always been a fan of those sort of like um, 
completely like uh, MUD style browser text games, you know, that have lingered around in the corners of the internet. Because to me, those have been the ones with the most interesting writing and the most kind of interesting character paths and stuff like that. And it's like, I, you know, I play all kinds of role playing games, but I always like I always keep one of those around uh, every so often. Um, and sorcery has really, really been interesting uh, for me. Well, I've just pulled it up on Steam myself, so I'm going to check it out. Oh, yeah, absolutely do. It's very, very good. Um, okay. Oh, man. And thank you, guys. There are some more, uh, some more followers. I am going to uh, I'm going to get to you guys in just a second, but I have so and by many. By the way, I noticed that sorcery is from Steve Jackson, who uh, yes. you know, and I are great friends. Uh, uh, a lot of people from the, all my SCA friends, Steve used to be the baron of the local SCA group, and we all used to go play car, uh, uh, play test all of his uh, games, Car Wars and GURPS, Auto Duel, that sort of thing that was coming up, and Ogre. Uh, and uh, that's also where I got most of my early employees for Origin was out of his company as well. So uh, we're, good, we're good buds, and uh, I've published a lot of his games uh, mm -hmm. back in my first company. Yeah, Steve Jackson is is uh, he's a huge influence on a lot of the, a lot of the RPG the pen and paper RPG scene. Um, he's made games that have kind of I've I've played a lot of the games that his company has released. Um, and uh, buh, 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 um, uh, um, Monito CS says, Richard, what's it like up in space? Well, of course, uh, uh, that's hard to give you a super short answer on, but I'll try to be brief. Uh, space is, of course, phenomenal. You know, it's, uh, there's nothing, there's almost nothing about it that is not, um, you know, pretty astounding, uh, in contrast to, you know, life here on the surface. Uh, you know, but, but even before you get to space, you know, the training for it is already a phenomenal experience. It's not, uh, it's not harder, it's not as hard as probably a lot of people think. You know, if you can, if you're a scuba diver, you can handle life support. If you can handle ham radios, you can do radio communications on a, on a rocket, if you can do high school physics, you can do orbital mechanics and docking maneuvers, that sort of thing. Uh, there's a lot to cover, but it's not, it's a joy to cover it. Um, you know, launch and reentry, which are the dangerous, fiery parts, are actually not as scary as you might think. They're actually very quiet and calm and smooth and cerebral, despite the energies involved and the velocities involved and the g-forces that slowly come on, uh, go, and, the, and in fact, the final impact on the surface of the earth in the case of landing in a Russian Soyuz like I did. But, uh, but by far the best part is just living 24 hours a day in space where you're floating around like Superman every moment of every day and every night. And you're looking out the window to this realization that one is you are completely isolated up here in space. You know, if, if something were to go wrong, there's no one on earth who can help you. You're, yeah. you know, you and the six of us that are on the vehicle together are, yeah, you sort of have this, or at least what I would imagine is sort of this foxhole brotherhood of uh, of reliance upon each other that is very deep. Uh, and yet when you look down at the Earth, it's not just that it's beautiful, it's that you really do feel like you understand by watching uh, how all the large-scale systems work. Erosion by water, erosion by wind, uh, the seams in the Earth at the tectonic plate movements, the, the, the building and movement of weather systems, uh, pollution, clear-cutting, human impact everywhere in forests and deserts and mountain passes and dams on rivers. And uh, and then only after you've been around a couple hundred times, you then also pass by a place you know well, like in my case where I grew up in Texas, and you go, wow, I now know, I know the scale of, the place, of this area in Texas that, I've, that I grew up very well, and I can now see at the same time the entire earth that I've just been around a couple hundred times. And you suddenly feel like I now know the true scale of the Earth by direct observation, and it is a, a very physically meaningful moment. You know, it's a uh, you have a very deep reaction to that. That is a lot of people have described it as something called the overview effect. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a it's a incredible, deep, deeply meaningful journey. Yeah, man. I I mean, I am. That that's probably one of the things I'm most envious of because I you know I've been a, into science and that kind of stuff since I was a kid, and like, yeah you know, I, I think I think we all have uh, we all kind of have that like and so uh, as 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 a, an addendum like how how uh, how long do you think it will be before you know before people will be joining you up in space? Well, so the here's the good news and the bad the good news the bad news and the good news. 
So the the good news is that the phenomenal cost and fair amount of danger that's involved in going into space is diminishing rapidly. You know, uh, the the peak cost and peak danger was actually with the space shuttle. Um, with the space shuttle, it costs you know somewhere between 100 and 200 million dollars per person to go to space, and the probability of death was one out of 70. And so we've all rolled double zeros on you know percentile dice every now and then, so you know that that is something that does happen. Uh, and so you know you have to be willing to accept a pretty significant risk uh, and pay an, a pretty phenomenal amount of uh, cost. And uh, but the good news is that uh, with Companies like SpaceX, the price is immediately dropping back down to about $20 million per person. When they get it reusable, he, Elon has said that he thinks he can get it underneath $1 million per person. A new and while you would go, like, still, it's a million bucks to go to space. That's still more than most people, most of us will have in our pocket. The good news is that, you know, on my own flight, I earned a few million dollars with the work that I was doing. And so if the price came down to a million dollars, then all we have to do is be clever enough to think of things to do and we can begin to sort of pay for our own trip. But but the better news is that the price continues to drop lower and lower. There's other technologies coming on board that should drop that even farther. That is, that is awesome. Man, I got I'm scrolling things. I got so many questions that people want to know uh, about. So let's uh, let's move on to uh, cuz we we have about 30 minutes le- to get through them all. So let's try and get through these. Um uh no we uh we we did that already. Uh we did that already. Um, uh, so, uh, I, I don't know how to read this. ISV Rada says, I've been testing and playing, uh, Shroud of the Avatar for two years. What is your most wished for feature in 2017? Oh yeah. Well, so, uh, uh, you know, it's interesting that, uh, when you look at the development of games, so this is the first time I've ever developed a game in the public eye. Uh, but one of my beliefs about the development of a game is that the first 80% of the time is putting in the kind of all the parts and pieces you need to make the world work with itself. You know, to you need, you know, weapons, you need magic, you need a map to scroll by, you need day and night cycles, you need some astronomy. And you, you're always, you're linking them together all along the way, but only when you have them all present do you then sit back and rub your hands and go, okay, now how can I make this sing? How do I, how do I balance those things against each other? And now how do I weave a story that takes you to all those highlights and make sure that the story uses as its plot destination the vistas, be those physical vistas or you know, uh, gameplay vistas, uh, that really showcase the game at its, at its best. And that all happens in that last 20%. So I believe that 80% of the value of, the, of what makes the game great happens in the last 20 percent and so uh uh so that's a, to my mind where we're at right now and to me that is uh a lot of it is bringing together the uh the the core systems we have through the story so it will be the story that kind of takes you around and leads you to all the high points that i want you to see in interaction and gameplay uh that really test you as an individual as to whether you are uh, you know, walking the straight and narrow path of the virtues as Lord British would want you to, as Lord British would want you to, or whether you have forsaken them on purpose and are willing to knowingly walk, walk, walk the dark path. And now you'll begin to explore that in this last 20% of the game, of the development of the game. That's awesome, man. Um, uh, uh, Al Dark Aaron Theus, that is a hard name to pronounce, says, uh, uh, Lord British, I have a tiny three tool kit uh, with the old Origin logo from a game called Auto Duel from around 1985. Do you happen to remember whose idea it was for this? Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, I have to show you that I have my toolkit, so I, I guess I don't need to grab it. So, the, uh, anyway, right back there is my stash of toolkits. Uh, on my, I still have sort of a keepsake uh, set of shelves there, center screen, and um, and I have all of the trinkets from all of the Origin games there: uh, Mobius headbands, to outer dual toolkits, uh, ogres, uh, radiation detection dots that were really worked, um, and uh, you know all the other bits and pieces. They're all there: onks and coins and other things, uh, moonstones. Um, and, uh, so the toolkits, you know, right after we did the Ankh in Ultima 4, so Ultima 4 I included, included not only the cloth maps that we had done in Ultimas 2 and 3, but it was the first one to have this trinket 
of an Ankh. And that was very popular right from the get-go. And because of that popularity, every game we did after that, we added trinkets into. And for Auto Duel, you know, I, I don't remember who specifically threw out the idea, but we were all sitting down in a conference room, at least in my mind's eye. And, uh, you know, we sat down and said, you know, what are we going to put in? You know, a, a wrench, you know, a car, a little plastic car? You know, what's the trinket for Auto Duel? And, uh, and we, would, we would be looking through these... This is before the internet, so we'd be looking through these physical catalogs of, you know, stuff you could buy with your company logo attached on it. And one of those things was those toolkits, and uh, that I'm sure you know came out of China or wherever it was, and we found in some, you know, corporate, you know, a swag book. Uh, and of course, it, you know, immediately struck us as the right thing to do. Awesome. Uh, yeah, that's Elder Duel is not a thing that I uh, I had any connection with. Follower. That was not one that that passed my radar. Um, probably but, the, but you may have heard of it as a, it's a Steve Jackson's title actually. Going back to Steve Jackson, yeah, uh, he he originally published it as uh, Car Wars, but uh, the Star Wars folks uh, gave him some guff for that, <laughs> and so that guff was going on right when we decided to make a computer game out of it. So we call it Auto Duel. But it's really Steve Jackson's Car Wars. I got you now. I'm uh, that definitely rings a bell. Um, so this is uh, an interesting game. Uh, the same uh, guy, Aldark Arinthius, says, uh, "Lord uh, British, have you played, uh, or have you heard of, or played uh, Divinity: Original Sin?" I've heard of it, of course, and uh, uh, but I've not played it. I've actually watched some of my employees playing it. It is very, uh, very and- good. You know, I understand it's very good, and you know, another one of the, uh, I'm not trying to cast them into the same area, but another game I've missed playing, but I know I would like, would be the Witcher series. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, there's a there's a number of a modern RPGs that I know I would enjoy immensely. I just, uh, it's just interesting that, um, uh, uh, you know, that there, are, there are games that I'm passionate about playing and learning from that are often outside of my own field. The ones that are in my own field, I enjoy watching them and having other people play them and, and observe them. But I, I'm not sure why I'm gun shy to play them. I don't know if I'm, you know, don't want to be emotionally distraught when I see something they did better than me, or <laughs> if I don't want to be thought of as plagiarizing them, or if uh, uh, you know I'm just not convinced enough by watching it that that's the one for me. I, I'm not actually sure why, but uh, but I do the same thing with television shows. Like I've never watched a single full episode of. Uh, Game of Thrones, uh, which of course everybody that I know has watched and, and describes as right up my alley. Uh, but on the other hand, you know I'm, I've watched every episode of Westworld so far. I mean, uh, so you know it's just uh, yeah. whichever happens to catch my eye. I'm, a, and, I'm actually uh, in the in that same camp. I uh, I gave up Game of Thrones mostly because everyone around me was talking about it, so I just didn't care that much. Uh, but Westworld was I, I really enjoyed it. Was it was really really good. Um, oh man, so stuff to get through. Uh, bu- 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 um, uh, Cal- uh, Cavalon says, uh, one of the greatest things about Ultimate Games was the sheer scope and, uh, for the time and difficulty. Will you, uh, uh, will you compromise on these now, uh, industry, uh, industry no-nos to re- reach a larger, l- oh, okay, so basically, uh, he's asking, um, uh, if you're if you're making a game now, would you sort of, um, it, it's kind of considered a considered not really done to put a ton to sit down and put a ton of work and money into the world and you know the making it fe- you know kind of fleshing out a large scale open world. Yeah, so so we're definitely going back to our roots uh, with Shroud of the Avatar and um, and we are not specifically change, chasing the big publisher ideals. Uh, in fact, when we talk to big publishers about what they help us do with distribution, that's usually the feedback we get is, oh, you silly little old school guys, you know, thank you, but we're not interested because, because you're not doing blank. Yeah. And those modern blank things, what's interesting is that, uh, you know, many of the modern techniques of helping the player were created for good reason, and many of them I helped create in because of the problems of my own earlier work. So, for example, if you look at a Calabeth and Ultima One and Ultima Two and maybe even Ultima Three, you had to use the keyboard for every command. So A meant attack, B meant board a vessel, C meant cast a spell, D meant drop an item, E meant enter, F was fire ships weapons, uh, G was get something, H was hand use your of your hand. Anyway, you get the idea. Is that 
Every letter ultimately a meant something, follower. which was incredibly difficult user interface. And then finally with Ultima 5, we went, hey, you know, those are really broken down to just a couple of key concepts. And we finally had a mouse. And so we did a command icon followed by a target in the game world, which later became just click or double click on the thing in the world. And similarly with conversation, originally it was, you know, you typed name, job, health, buy. Yeah. And later on you type click on keywords. Well, what's interesting is that's also how auto mapping occurred. That's how quest logs occurred. That's how exclamation points over your head occurred. Uh, that's how arrows on the map to lead you to the thing you've highlighted in your quest lock occurred. And so all of those things, all those features were created to help it expand into a more mass market. But I think something, the good parts of that were where it took something that was actually unnecessarily painful and got, got you through it. Those were good ideas. To me, where it became a bad idea is where it suddenly, like a quest a log, follower. made every quest basically the same. There's go to this location, kill these things, bring back these parts of those things, and I will give you this specifically predefined reward. And, it's, and because it's all compartmentalized, it means everything is the same. And then you're just in a grind game. Then you're just in a game that is a level grind. And while some of those level grinds are great, by the way, I mean, a level grind game can be great, that's just not at all what I'm interested in doing. I'm much more interested in taking you through something that's much more, you know, quote, honestly exploratory. Uh, but I want to make sure I'm not punishing you for that choice. So... You know, we're putting some maps in the game. We may or may not give you some automation of those. We may or may not be able to give you some way to make notations in those. But we're not putting explanations over people's heads where there's no such thing as a quest log. They're not compartmentalized in that way. But we don't want you to suffer for it. I'm not going to make you go back. In the early Ultimas, you had to actually write down oh, yeah. everything everyone said to you. Well, I, I in our case, my journal you somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In our case, you have a journal. And the ones that are tasks, you can look at separately. And so as long as somebody said, hey, I really need you to go do this for me, that journal entry is separated as a task. Just, just as a quick aside, uh, did you play and were you a fan of uh, uh, the Elder Scrolls Morrowind? I, back in the day, uh, I played it some, but mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember the details that well. Just because I, I maintain that it's probably one of the best computer RPGs ever made, um, only specifically because at the time, like, it was when you talk to a quest giver, it had the, the highlighted words that you could click on to get more of, but, like, any time that they gave you, like, not everything the quest giver, the, the NPC said, but when you got a new piece of information or uh, related to a quest or a new quest, it would be automatically written down in your journal, but it would never be, like, it wasn't until later that you could actually sort a them by the follower. quests. But it, your journal was literally just the text they said. And sometimes they, they just give you directions. They'd say, go north down this road and then turn left at the Foida and then pass the sign and you're in the cave. And it's like, and it was, it really felt like a game that made you kind of explore and figure out what they wanted you to do. And kind of, it was, it, I think it was, it was probably one of the best role playing games I've ever played. And, and by the way, I, I, that's exactly the kind of decisions we are trying to make with this one. We're trying not to make it brain dead. Mm -hmm. We're trying to make you need to pay attention and not just follow the arrows. Yeah, uh, Archie Israel says, uh, "Exploding Dice." If you played Elder Scrolls Online, I have. I have an account. I, it's, it's okay. It's eh. Um, oh man. Uh, so Dustin Wilson says, "Richard, uh, I've played Ultima games for years and recently gotten into SCA um, Society for Creative Anachronism, I believe." Um, Correct. I always forget that uh, whether that's right or not. Uh, he says, and it was nice finding out that you were uh, you were involved in it. Was Shamano your name in SCA? And the answer is yes. And uh, uh, and so what's interesting too is Yolo and Dupre and Shamano and Mariah and all those other names of the eight main characters and many of the leaders of the towns uh, and other characters are real people I know through the SCA back in Austin, Texas. And uh, uh, and for those who know me well, know that in Austin I've built uh, a medieval theater that we call the Curtain Theater, and a whole medieval town called Castleton, and uh, and we've got cabins that that are in homage to all the original characters that are there, uh, and uh, so yeah, so I still live role play through the SCA with those people who are both my D and D 
buddies as well as SCA players. I don't know all of them. I know Yolo. I I've seen him a couple times, and I know he's a he. Does he still make crossbows? Absolutely. He's probably he's he's also on Twitter and Twitch and stuff too. So good odds he's listening in. Hi Yolo, if you are. <laughs> and uh, but yeah, he that's that's his main business is making crossbows for a living. So. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, that's exactly what he does. That is awesome, man. I haven't been able to get into uh, costuming and LARPing just because I have not had the time. But, man, uh, um, it, it's one of those things where I've always wanted to get involved. Uh, so let me let me scroll back, see if I missed any questions. Uh, if you guys haven't, uh, if we missed your question, you can just go ahead and shoot it. Uh, exclamation, t- exclamation point fuzzy in the chat. And Daisu will tell you that you're hanging out with us. Go ahead and ask your live questions, um, anything you want. Make sure to tag at Exploding Dice so I don't miss them, and we will get to them, uh, and we will tr- oh, we will try and get to them before the show is over. Um, uh, Defrog Gotten says, um, he wants to know, he says, does the Killer Children Room still exist in Ultima Games? Absolutely. <laughs> and so if you, don't know, if you don't know this, I have to explain. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, in Ultima 4, in the finale of Ultima 4, I, you know, you're this paragon of virtue. I had, I made a sequence of rooms to hopefully, you know, try to trick you to mess up in either honesty or compassion or valor or justice, sacrifice, honor, spirituality, humility. And the, the rooms actually often as not didn't have a test in them. It just had the illusion of a test. And that was all that mattered because you know, I wanted to just make you on your best behavior. And so one that was just an illusion, there really was no test was a room with children in cages in the corner of the room and a lever in the middle of the room. And the children were actually monsters. In fact, it was in a dungeon, and the only way I could put children, there was no, I couldn't put an NPC with a conversation in a dungeon. There was only you and monsters and treasure. Mm-hmm. So these children icons were monsters that happened to look like children. And when you pull the lever, the cages are released, and the children swarm around you and start chewing on your ankles. And so I thought, ha-ha, this is going to be a good test of the Avatar because they're not going to want to kill the children. And they'll be worried about losing some virtue. But I know they're monsters, and so I don't really care how they get through the room. It's just a good test. Ha-ha, move on. And, and one of our QA staffers wrote a letter to my brother when he got to that point in the game just before it was released and said, and the letter said, I refuse to work for a company that so clearly supports <laughs> child abuse. And my brother comes with this letter going, Richard, what have you done? And I'm going, I have no idea what he's talking about. So we go ask him, and he points into this room. And I'm like, please, this punch that he has been affected so emotionally about this room. And so I'm pleased that I've done something great. And my brother's saying, we will not ship it with that room in the game. And I'm going, screw you, my brother. I'm not going to take that out of the game. So you can publish it or not, but it's staying in the game. And then he got my parents involved, and my mom who usually took my side, and my dad usually took my brother's side, and this time my mother abandoned me, and she too said I should take it out, because who wants good housekeeping to come out against you? And I'm like, screw you, you're all wrong. This is a brief moment of provoking emotional reaction in a game. I'm keeping it in. And we kept it in, and we published it, and no one ever complained about it. And uh, But because of that, I have put a room to the homage of killing children in every game since. That's what I was and, that's what I was going to ask. I was going to say like is it intentional cuz I can see you design a game where like you happen to like kids happen to be hostile and stuff like that but I, whether it was an intentional like no we're putting this in here to screw with players. Well no, the first time it was just a test to see yeah. if you, you know, by the way, if you didn't want to kill them, you could put them to sleep, you could charm them. You yeah. can put up your sword and punch them and they'd run away. There were lots of ways through it that didn't involve killing the children. And in all these cases, in most all the cases, that's the case. That's true. That last one, by uh, the way, that's what I usually do. But uh, but the uh, uh, but 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 even in Shroud of the Avatar, there is an homage to killing children. That of course, my my team, even the ones that are listening in tonight, are probably just going like, "Oh God, Richard, here he goes again." <laughs> and uh, uh, and it's really over there. Objections because each time I have to get either more creative or more uh, horrific, and uh, and so Shroud of the Avatars is a particularly tasty one, and uh, we'll see what people do when they find it. Oh man, I I just remember like it, it had escaped me for a while. I only remembered it in the later game, and then uh, I watched. Obviously, you know, uh, I kind of came back to a lot of the older games. Like my memories came back when I watched uh, a friend of both of ours, uh, Noah. Um, 
making his, his videos on the subject, and he was just like, in every video, he was like, all right, seriously, I'm done with this killing children shit. And I'm like, yeah, no, come to think of it, no, I, I, it came up quite a lot. <laughs> oh, man, that's funny. Um, I'm trying to find, uh, so, again, we have a couple, we have about 15 more minutes, we'll take, like, one or two more questions. Uh, Saladid has been asking this a couple times, uh, so I want to make sure I get to it, because it seems kind of personal. Um, he says, uh... Uh, I know uh, everyone he says I know everyone talks about good games, good times. Um, uh, but was there any particular moments of your professional career or stuff that were kind of particularly scary, or you know, you didn't really know what you were gonna do? Uh, yeah, interesting question. Um, you, you know, I've, uh, fortunately, there's there's been few true danger times, but but oddly, there there is one mentioned. In this book, <laughs> the, uh, uh, I had a, a fan uh, break into my house one night, and uh, it was a person uh, who was na whose That's name was far. Daniel Dukes. He had played my games. He'd been through my haunted houses, apparently. Uh, he was literally schizophrenic. And uh, broke into my home about three o'clock one morning, and uh, uh, and I actually have you know my house is filled with medieval arms and armor, crossbows and swords, and I also had a gun safe full of guns, but I've never thought of those guns as home defense, and so I didn't have ammunition really for any of them that I at least knew about that mm -hmm. matched, and but I did actually find a weapon that matched ammunition, and I stood at the top of my stairs with a gun. Uh, and, and ultimately ended up shooting at this person inside my house and uh, didn't kill them, uh, but uh, they did ultimately die by being chomped on by the killer whale at SeaWorld uh, as one of the three people the Florida SeaWorld has killed. And so it was recently described again in the movie Blackfish that came out this last year. Uh, but in any case, if you want to see hear my story of Daniel Dukes breaking into my house and me shooting at him, that's in the book. A new follower. Did now wait? Did you actually have a? Did you have a conversation with him? Like, because because I can imagine if someone breaks your house and you're like standing at the top of the stairs with a gun, you can be like, "All right, guy, let's talk about this." No, I, well, so it's a it's a long story, but uh, uh, it, it actually happened on the night the comet Shoemaker Levy crashed into Jupiter of all nights. Uh, and, uh, and that's when I had left the security gates of my house open because I had friends over to make that observation. So I thought it was just a friend arriving at my house in the middle of the night uh, until they threw a rock through the window and, you know, and, and came in. But when they started to come in, I already banged, I went to bang on a window and broke the window. And so I opened a window effectively between me and him and said, get the F out of my house as he came into my house, follower. which alarmed me enough to obviously call the police. Uh, and, uh, and then, yeah, when I, I held him at gunpoint for 10 minutes before he decided he was no longer interested in being held at gunpoint, which is when shots were fired. That is, that's some scary stuff, man. Um, man, and so, uh, yeah, and every, people in chat seem to agree. Um, so let's, uh, why don't we take, why don't we take this one last question, because I think this is really interesting, and then, because I definitely want to thank all these followers, but I think this is, this is an interesting question, because I think it'll, it'll kind of, uh, bookend things a lot. Um, it says, Richard, as someone who, uh, who has kind of written about and promotes virtue, what are your thoughts on actions that may, you know, that may require less overt virtuousness, more subtlety? Uh, do you inherently see those things as unvirtuous? Um, well, do I see things as unvirtuous? So, so I, so what's interesting about the virtues is, you know, when I, when I first started working on it, uh, and still at some fundamental level, I of course think it is fiction in the sense of, I designed it for a purpose. Mm -hmm. I actually designed it for a game. But when I set out to do that, I did it because I didn't see there was a particularly good set of virtues in anything that existed that I could pattern after. You know, I, I don't happen to personally be a religious person, and so when I thought about, you know, I'm going to do a game about the Ten Commandments, I'm going, well, I don't actually believe the Ten Commandments, so that one wouldn't be a, necessarily appropriate. I'm going to do one about the Seven Deadly Sins, and I go like, well, that makes a good scary movie, but doesn't create a game about 
you being good, you know, being a good person. Uh, I went and started reading all the Greek tragedy, you know, the Greek uh, utopian uh, philosophies, and didn't find much there. I began to read Buddhism, and I'm going like, hey, I actually like a lot of that, but it didn't gamify very well, and it got again down to a, it began to lean on spiritual things that I didn't really quite uh, personally uh, uh, found found as truthiness enough, and so I said, gee, I'm gonna have to actually make something up. I'm going to actually have to literally go do the research and come up with a system of virtues of my own. And I'm going like, wow, that is a tough call. And I read tons, and I put up post-it notes on the walls about what I thought was universal. And I eventually arrived at the principles of truth and love and courage that I think really are fundamental and, and universal. And then I came up with the eight virtues as sort of a nomenclature to break it down into smaller areas. And so over time, I've actually gone and said, even though it was created for fictional purpose, it actually has a lot of truth in it. It is there's nothing sinister about it. There's nothing bad about it. It may not be complete, but it is. But everything about it is positive, and it really has made me then reflect on other things about life. And so when you ask, when the uh, person asks, you know, what do I think about uh, small indiscretions that that you know are are they unvirtuous? I'm going like, well, that is a. It goes back to that first story I told you about the Popeye olive oil and his friends. I mean, there's there's in almost every real decision you make in life you're going to do some good and some harm and someone's going to think that you're a, a great person for doing it and someone is going to be suspicious of your motivations and think you did it for the wrong reason and in fact in reality we are complex beings there's going to be reasons that are selfish that you will make some decisions that might actually bias which side of that balance you would you would come out on and so i don't think that you have to live in any one particular way. I think that as long as you're paying attention to it, I actually believe trying to live a life of virtue, which to me just means I care about my impact in the world. I'm really, I am, I don't want to be thought of negatively. I don't want to be, I don't want to actually have the result of my existence be that I have lessened the world with my time here. I would much rather have had a positive influence with my time. And I think if we all do that, then whatever conclusions you come to, I respect it. Very, very interesting. And again, very uh, deep. Like I think that it's it's deeply interesting um, because we uh, man, the music is gone. Uh, because we all, um, you know, I, I think anyone who played the the ultimate games, myself included, like we all kind of found something. They, I or at least I hope we all kind of found something in there that. Uh, suggested like you know the yes this this is a fictional system for a game but it's like but there's nothing inherently wrong with it like there's nothing inherently wrong with striving to kind of live your life in the in the it, to be a you know an exemplar of the best ideals that you can yeah you know, and, and and when I think about it too and again this truthiness that it has. You know, I, I look at almost every other belief system that has been written over the thousands of years that belief systems have been written down, and I'm going, most of them have these really painful pills to swallow, like, you know, you should stone women who somehow offend you, you know, <laughs> to death. You know, I mean, I'm going, really? Is that really, does it need to be in my system of belief that yeah. I should murder people because I don't agree with them or they've spurned me or hurt me in some way? Isn't that, you know, cutting off a hand, is that really fair? Really, you know, the uh, uh, and so, so yeah, so the, you know, I actually have the, the more years go by, the more affinity I actually have for it, mm -hmm. and it's been very interesting to see how a lot of other people have ex expressed similar affinity as you've been hearing now online. And I've had people show me their wedding rings that have been inscribed with truth, love, and courage, or of course, uh, plenty of people, including myself, have gotten tattoos of, of, of things. Uh, but almost universally, when people come up, they, they feel like they have to give it the caveat of. Just so you know, I know that it's. I know you wrote it as fiction. Yeah. But I also think it has a lot of really good things to say, and uh, it's interesting that people feel the need to make the caveat, uh, which I, which as did I. Uh, but uh, but I actually do think that if you if you literally just try to measure it as a meme against other, you know, supposedly real philosophy systems, it it holds up pretty well. Definitely, definitely really interesting stuff. And I think that's probably going to be the last question we have time for because we are running out of time here. But 
Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much to everyone uh, for joining us. Before we uh, before we do, I want to uh, we get into the last little bit of things. Uh, I want to thank T N Motion and Z M uh, Z Zimic Three and Alvcard and Duffsnick and Alex Rock Eighty Eight and Badgers and Bowties and Night Wilder and God of BZD and Tashuesta and. Gurjot147 and Durblitz or Durbilt and the Vooch and the Orgundy and Sentry Fun and Erwin Rippentop for hanging out with th and for joining us. Thank you for hanging out. Thank you for joining the madness and welcome to uh, welcome to Dice Thulu's Embrace. Thank you guys for following. You guys are all awesome. Um, and so let's let's kind of. Uh, it's gonna bring bring things to a uh, a little bit of a close here. I want to give a big thanks to uh, my my good my my new good friend and my longtime hero uh, Richard Garriott for hanging out with me. Thank you so much, man. Um, oh, thanks for having me on. Absolutely, great, and great questions both from you and from your listeners. A bunch of unique uh, and important uh, and uh, great questions to get a chance to answer. Definitely. Uh, so before we uh, before we kind of wrap things up, do you want to tell uh, tell people a little bit about um, kind of what you're doing right now, where they can find you on the internet, and uh, anything else you want to any hooks and plugs you want to throw in? A new follower. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, uh, uh, I'm on Twitter at Richard Garriott. Uh, very easy. And uh, uh, and of course, please do come play Shroud of the Avatar, shroudofthevatar.com. Uh, check out my new book, Explore Create, coming out uh, January 10th. You can get it on any of your favorite booksellers. I think there's uh, Book People in Austin is doing autographed copies uh, at the moment. Uh, and uh, uh, but yes, uh, you know, one thing to say for any of you that that are still have either played Ultimates in the past or are going back to good old games, getting the olds and replaying them. Uh, you know, we are. I still do the as all these letters are here behind me. If people write in. In all my games, I started this thing early on that when you get to the end, there's a please report your feet to Lord British. And if people write a letter in and says report their feet, I send them back a certificate. And I do that to this day. Uh, and in the modern era of email and Twitter and et cetera, I now return the response in whatever way you contacted me. So if you tweet directly to me uh, a screenshot of your uh, completion of any of my games, uh, I will tweet back at you. If you sign the letter, I'll send you a letter. Uh, but obviously, it's a it's a great dialogue. I enjoy having that connection, and it's actually inspires the way we make these games for you is to hear from you about the uh, uh, just be kind in your usual letters of you know one thing I've liked your game and pages often of here's what you did wrong. Let me tell you how to do it better. Uh, just be kind in that second half. But if you're kind and succinct, we'll take those ideas and we'll wrap them up into how we provide you gaming in the future. So Absolutely. Thanks. Um, so definitely, uh, the Twitter link is in chat. Go check that out, as is the link to, uh, to Shroud of the Avatar. All that stuff. Go, go say hi. Go show them your love. And, um, you know, and definitely, if you haven't already, get those, get, uh, get your certificates. I know I got one when I was 11, and if you haven't gotten yours... Uh, if you haven't gotten a, a, a Richard Garriott, uh, Lord British certificate, then your life probably isn't complete. Um... <laughs> As you can tell, my life peaked at 11, and then was all just downhill from there. So, <laughs> oh man! But thank you so much for hanging out. I appreciate every single one of you. You guys are awesome. And again, a huge thanks to Lord British himself, Richard Garriott, for hanging out with me. I uh, I had such a good time. I I certainly hope all of you did too. And a big thanks to Twitch for putting us on the front page and making us part of their community spotlight. Something like 750 of you guys came out to uh, to hang out with us at at points and it was it's just been it's been amazing. Uh, so before I get out of here just uh, some quick announcements. If you guys if this is your first time on the channel and all of your all of the new followers, you can see there's a schedule down below. We have live D&D on this channel every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern. So you can come here, you can hang out with me and the Exploding Dice crew as we play the Jade Regent campaign. It's a D&D 5th edition campaign. Uh, I am the dungeon master and my players are a combination of podcasters and voice actors and other really funny cool people. It's such a good time. 
Uh, I highly suggest you join us for that. Um, there are also some other campaigns. I hang out on uh, on some other channels and DM every so often. I'm going to be DMing this weekend uh, as part of uh, Unmade Gaming's uh, twitch.tv slash Unmade Gaming's 12-hour celebration stream. I'm going to be DMing the final game in that, uh, that marathon. So you want to come out, s hang out, and see how I do kind of Christmas-themed horror, you can uh, you can absolutely join me there. Um, as always, uh, we uh, if you want to keep up with all of this content, hitting that follow button is the best way to do it. You get alerts whenever we go live, uh, and you can also hit me up on Twitter. It's just at Askren, uh, and you will see every bit of, of information about when we're doing stuff and what we're doing and all the, the new, the next guests for the fuzzy dice show and just all that good stuff. Um, and, uh, as always, I, I like to throw in at the last minute. Um, if, if you guys like the show and I hope you did, I work a full time job and then I come home and I stream for you guys and it's such a blast. But if you want to keep the show going and growing and make it better, consider becoming a patron. Uh, you can hit that Patreon link right there. Uh, it's just patreon.com slash exploding dice and you can help us uh, grow in that way. We have patron goals and rewards to help you affect our D&D games if you want to get involved that way. And I also missed it, but I wanted to thank Rick Haltrop who became a patron uh, earlier during the show. So thank you so much, man. Thank you for joining us. You are awesome. And if I had a bottle opener with me, I would open this brand new beer and toast you. Um, but seriously, thank all you guys and you guys have been a blast. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get out of here, but thank you so much to, um, I wanna shout them out, uh, real quick. Thank you to Archie is Real and Richard Justice for following. Welcome, my follower. friends. Uh, we're gonna get out of here. We, we got things to do. You got things to do. We got other shows to watch and host. But as always, uh, oh, and Sheds are just remind me, last thing, we crushed that 1K goal, so watch Twitter for that one, that 24-hour stream announcement. It's definitely gonna be happening in January. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's nuts. We're, uh, 24 hour stream, all kinds of great guests. I can't even name them right now for you, but I will in when I can in, uh, in maybe a week or so or after the holidays when everything's start cooling down. We're going to get out of here, but as always, don't let Dice Thulu get his tentacles on you because he gets very handsy when he does. <laughs> we'll see you next time, guys. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.